Well, good morning, everyone. It is uh, Thursday, and this is only our third uh, time together for lecture. And um, with this holiday week coming in, it doesn't seem like we've gotten into much of a routine yet, has it? Uh, the, uh, let's take a look at the syllabus for a moment, and let me give you a couple of announcements. And I'm getting a few emails from students who are still a little bit confused as to how to kind of get going, especially since we haven't had much of a routine yet. So if you look at the syllabus, we've already gone over chapter one. And we finished that mostly the first day. I got through a large part of chapter two last time, and I'll finish up chapter two today. I'll also finish up the last vocabulary through 16 today. And that means that next Tuesday we have an exam. All right, so next Tuesday will be our first lecture exam. It's going to cover chapters one and two. And don't forget that the presentation made in lab one is also very, very important on this exam. So really, uh, you've got three sets of notes to look at in preparing for this exam. You've got chapter one from lecture, you've got chapter two from lecture, and you definitely want to go back and look very carefully at lab one, okay? Those PowerPoint notes and everything that you did there. Now, some of you have been quizzed on that already in lab yesterday. Some of you won't be quizzed on that until next Monday, right? As far as being quizzed over directional terms and that sort of thing. But just know that as you're preparing for that quiz, you are also preparing for this first exam. Uh, vocabulary 1 through 16, that was A through 0, I believe, and I'll finish those slides up right now. Also, in preparation for the exam, uh, I want you to know that I have used Mastering AMP in the past, but there are some new parts of Mastering that I'm using for the first time this semester, and I'm going to ask you on the first exam how successful you think some of those tools were in helping you prepare. And then once I see your feedback, uh, from that first exam. I'll have a little survey on the first exam. Then I'll make some adjustments, if necessary, on how to move forward. But I want everyone to do all that's on these assignments for the first week or for the first exam. So I'm also getting a few questions about how to get to the, the flicks uh, for the lab. So let me just remind you that you're in Blackboard and you're going to go in, under lab for everything related to lab. But under Mastering AMP, when you click on that, you click on the top link, and I think yours looks very similar to this as far as getting to that top link. Once you are in mastering, my mastering course is this big orange uh, background, and it's here that the very first thing you'll see is a calendar, right? And the calendar has deadlines on it. So there was, back in August, we had that uh, introduction to mastering, and there were also some gr uh, chapter one modules. It's those modules that are brand new for me. These are called dynamic study modules, and I want to see how you think they're helping you understand the material. So please do these. Um, and then there were also some for group t uh, for chapter two, one of which was due yesterday, one of which is due tonight. If you missed it, please just do what you can. Now moving into September, so that you got the chapter two assignments here, and you'll want to watch this calendar for updates. I've got nothing on here for the second exam because I'm waiting to hear back from you as to which and how I might use or modify these assignments. There will always, however, be an exam quiz. So I have a quiz. It is due no later than next Monday evening at midnight. This, is, this quiz is to help you get ready for the exam on Tuesday. Now, it's due no later than Monday. It's untimed. It's open book. It's open resource. And so you should do well on it, but it should help you really do well on the material. Due before that, again, any time between now and next Sunday, there's some homework. Okay, now I did this in the summer and the homework was very, very successful. So there's two homework assignments for chapter one and chapter two. They're available to you now. You can start them anytime, but they're due no later than Sunday. And then there's a quiz that will really help you pull together the last ideas for the exam. And then depending upon how you do in the homework, there is what's called adaptive follow-up. So if you struggle in a particular area of the homework, it will then generate another assignment for you to do to really solidify what you did poorly on. So you want to do well in the homework. If you do really well in the homework, it won't give you any adaptive follow-ups. Right? So if you ace the homework, check, you're done. But if you struggle in the homework, then it's going to give you another assignment to do to help you know, learn that material that you struggled on. So the idea is mastering, right? You're going to do it and do it until you get it. And so please uh, do those assignments. Don't forget these, uh, this quiz. This is worth 10 points toward your grade. And then the adaptive follow-ups would be due any time after you do the homework. So 
So just be sure to get those things done, and then I will load up for what's coming up for exam two. Now, once you're in mastering, uh, all the study activities are down here under study area. So click on study area, and it will bring you to a link. And this now brings you to that Martini Visual textbook website. And it's here that you have, for chapters one and chapter two, you have all sorts of pre-tests and quizzes and activities and practice tests that you can also do on your own. Those are not required, but they are available for you if you feel like you need more practice. And then it's also down here under tutorials that you'll find the A&P Flicks that you need to turn in. Watch that mitosis video for lab two. And it's also under here that you'll find PAL later on in the semester when we're doing the dissections and using that resource. So that's here in the study area. I'm working on getting a button, if you will, that will be listed right off here in Blackboard that would bring you right to that site, right? So there's, not, there's one step to get there rather than two, to the study area. Okay, big commercial, big infomercial, but is there anything in any of that conversation that's not making sense to you and you're not sure how to proceed? Yes. Thank you. You will need the one Scantron. You'll need six during the semester. You'll need one for Tuesday. And that's an 884-E. That's a full-size green, uh, eight and a half by 11, double-sided type form. Does anybody have one of those with them? Just, just make a visual. There we go. That's the right one. Okay, so it's double-sided. It's green. Uh, you may have to ask specifically for that form. That is not the orange form that is commonly found in the bookstore, and it's not the half form that is commonly found in the bookstore or in the vending machines. So that is a full-sized uh, 8.5 by 11, 884-E. It's in the syllabus, and you might have to ask for it up at the front uh, in the bookstore. If you buy all six of them now, that's great. Just make sure you keep them all in a nice, safe place so they don't get ratty looking by the time you need them. Uh, vocabulary, remember that there will be um, some vocab on this exam. I think I went through with you, seems to me I got through Bronc, but you tell me, did I get through bio or did I get through Bronc with you last time? Anybody have a note or a recollection? I think so too. I remember saying blast, so I think I did Bronc. So let's do 12 through 16 right now. Now you've seen Buke. Uh, buccal is referring to the cheek. It's one of your directional or one of your area terms on the body. Uh, burse uh, it refers to purse. It doesn't make much sense to you yet, but around your joints, there's a bursa. Many of your joints have a bursa, and it's like a purse or another way of thinking about it. It's almost like a gel pack, and it's an extra area of protection around some of your joints. Uh, if you have bursitis, you have an inflammation of that bursa. Cals calcium. Uh, Calo, if you have a callus, you have an area of thickened skin, so callo meaning thick, and calic is a small cup, and when we get to the kidneys, we'll see that structurally, as the urine is being formed, it first drains into these calices, into these cup-like structures within the kidney. Capito, um, capitis, or uh, capito is referring to the head. Um, when we get to the bones, we'll see that the capitis is the head of the bone. Carcin, cancer, something that's carcinogenic is cancer-causing. Cardio, the heart, I think we've got that one. And carpo, remember the carpus or the carpals refers to the wrist. I mentioned last time catabolic reactions are those where molecules are broken down and typically energy is released during that breakdown. So catabol or cat means breakdown. You've seen caudal as a directional term toward the tail, and cephalic or cephal means toward the head. Centesis, you've probably heard of amniocentesis. That's a procedure where uh, a needle is inserted into the amniotic sac around uh, the, the fetus, and fluid is removed for analysis. So centesis is a surgical puncture to remove fluid. Uh, cerebro, the brain. Cerebrospinal fluid is the fluid found around the brain. You know that the cervical region refers to the neck. Chondro. Uh, you saw hypochondriac region, right? And hypochondriac region means under, hypo, chondro, the cartilage or what makes up part of the ribs. So hypochondriac or chondro, in this case, meaning cartilage. Chloro means green, chloroform, um, chloroplasts, those are all organelles that you'll, you'll hear about in a plant biology course. Uh, chlorosis would be a greenish color tingingness to your skin uh, from an iron deficiency. 
And chrono is time if you have a chronic condition. It's one that's going to last a very long time. Lastly, for this exam, chromo. You guys are mostly too young to remember Kodachrome film, right, when cameras required film. But there's Fuji code, Fuji Chrome and Kodachrome, and that was colored film, right, an upgrade from the black and white film of era before that. So I remember that for Chrome. Um, chyme, when you are, when you consume food, uh, the stomach breaks down that food into a pasty liquid-like substance called chyme or juice. Uh, side means to kill, spermicide, homicide. Circum, circumnavigate, circumduction, uh, all referring to a round. And sero, if you have cirrhosis, a condition of the liver, it can cause a yellowing of the skin and of the eyes. And that's where uh, the sero, meaning yellow, um, and cirrhosis, again, of the liver causes yellowing of the skin. So we've got these terms. Again, you're going to hopefully have made up some flashcards, and you're not stressing over these terms. Uh, you just need to know that the term and the meaning. The example is optional. If that helps you remember it, great. But I'm not going to ask you specifically about the examples. Okay. Any concerns or questions about the vocab? This will be a, not 100%, but most of it will be fill in the blank. So it'll say, remember I gave you the example? I said, what would ambi algae mean? And you'll remember that ambi means both sides, right? And algae means pain. So for two points, you would tell me ambi means both sides and algae means pain, and that would be a fill in the blank kind of thing. Okay. Any thoughts on vocab? Feeling pretty comfortable with that? Very good. Well, let's go back and take a look at chapter two. And as I'm pulling this up, is there, are there any thoughts or concerns about anything we discussed in chapter one or up through this area in chapter two? Recall in chapter two, we've already discussed uh, the atomic structure, the, the structure of the atom made of, made of protons and neutrons and electrons. We went through why each of those components was important and the fact that the electrons were really what we are most concerned about in this class because it's the electrons in the outer shell which are going to dictate which atoms can or cannot combine to make molecules. We went through how those different atoms combine, that is atomic, or sorry, covalent bonds and ionic bonds. Covalent bonds came in two flavors, uh, polar and nonpolar. And polar covalent bonds, our example was water. Nonpolar covalent bond, our example was hexane. And then the ionic bonds, our example was sodium chloride. If that story made sense to you, great. You'll get a chance to sort of retell that story in pre lab number two as you're preparing for the lab and the Amerman pre lab materials. And if you have not, if you have Monday lab and you have not yet started to conquer that pre lab number two, I think you'll find it very helpful, especially if you struggled at all with understanding this chemistry. So definitely start taking a look at that. Don't wait until Sunday night. Uh, to look at the lab materials. Uh, then we got into the idea of uh, chemical reactions, that there's uh, reactions where there's a synthesis and where A and B are chemically combined to make something else. And that combining is really, if we think about it, it's the reorganization of the electrons in the outer shell. And if we're making something, that's an anabolic reaction. And typically, if you're making something, it's going to require energy or ATP to make that happen, whereas other reactions are breaking things down, these decomp or catabolic reactions. And as we break molecules down and break those chemical bonds, energy is typically released. And then we finished up right about here, didn't we, that in our body, what facilitates or catalyzes chemical reactions are enzymes. And enzymes are going to facilitate or lower the energy needed to jumpstart or to get a chemical reaction to go. And nearly every chemical reaction in our body, in our biochemistry, requires an enzyme. Enzymes are proteins. We'll get into that in a little bit. Um, and in this graph, what we're seeing is that for a reaction to occur, there's always a little bit of an uphill push that's necessary to get that chemical reaction to go. And once it gets to the top, once that energy that's going in pushes it to the top of the hill, if you will, then it will go spontaneously. 
And what enzymes are going to do is lower that hump. So it's going to make it easier for the cell to initiate that chemical reaction. And without enzymes, our body, our biochemistry would basically come to a complete halt. And then I think I finished up with just an introduction of acids and bases, and you'll hear this again in lab next week and also be interacting with some of this material in your lab, pre-lab. So if you've taken a chem class, you know that there are different ways of defining an acid or a base, but the one that we're going to use I think is the most straightforward, and it's the only one we need to be concerned about for this class, and that is that an acid is something that when put into water releases H+, releases a hydrogen ion, or releases what's called a proton, but we'll just call it a hydrogen ion for here. So our in lab, the acid we're going to be using is HCl, hydrochloric acid. Uh, that's the, the acid that you'll be testing in lab. And HCl, when you put it into water, releases that H+. Plus, and you know that when there's more H+, plus, the acidity is increased and the pH value goes down. Bases, when put into water, instead release hydroxyl, OH-. Um, and then a salt is something that when you put it into water, it will dissociate. But it will dissociate into something other than H plus and OH minus. So the salt we've been talking about is sodium chloride. Right? So if I take sodium chloride and I put it into water, I don't get H plus or OH minus. I instead get the sodium and chloride ions. So this idea of the pH scale, let me just kind of start here revamping up. Anything in that conversation at all to be re-clarified or restated? OK, so pH, it's a scale from 0 to 14. It's a logarithmic scale, which means that every number on this scale is a tenfold difference in the concentration of hydrogen. Now, pH stands for the power of hydrogen, little p, big H, the power of hydrogen. And what this is suggesting is that as there is more hydrogen, look at this scale, it's going from 0 to 14. And as there is more acid, right, or I should say as there's more H+, plus, something is more acidic. <clears throat> the more acidic something is, the lower the pH value. So strong acids like hydrochloric acid have a very, very low pH value. They have a very, very low pH value because, remember I said that when HCl is put into water, it gives off H+. Plus. So we get a lot of H+, plus. we get a, therefore a high acidity and a low pH value. Conversely, bases are giving off OH minus. And the more OH minus there is, the more alkaline or the more basic something is described as being. Now, what this slide sort of misses is that it looks like, oh, there's only H plus when you're an acid, and there's only OH minus when there's a base. And in reality, H plus is always there, but there's more of it or less of it. So when you look at this, I want you to imagine up here there's a lot of H+, plus, right? Very acidic. And down here there's still a little bit, right? It's just not as much. So this is the relative scale as to how much H+, plus and OH- minus there is. Now right smack in the middle of this is neutral. And uh, maybe this will help you appreciate this idea of... Neutral. So what happens when you put water into water? Did I go through this with you last time? OK. So again, we put water into water, and what happens? An equal amount of H plus and OH minus are dissociated. It's not very much, but water does dissociate a little bit. So that's why the pH value of 7 right, is neutral, because at 7, you have an equal amount of H plus and an equal amount of OH minus. Okay, so that's neutral. Now, let's talk about this idea of the logarithmic scale. The logarithmic scale, and many of you may not be that familiar with log, but it's a, it's a tenfold difference in concentration of hydrogen for each of these numbers. It's the same sort of scale that's used for earthquakes, right? for Richter scale on earthquakes. So if you hear that there's an earthquake of 6 and an earthquake of 7, right? it doesn't sound like a big difference, but 7 is 10 times more intense than 6. And if you hear about an earthquake of three and an earthquake of five, two numbers, the five is how many more fold intense than the three? Earthquake three, earthquake five, 
the 5 is 100 times worse, right? 10 times 10. Okay, and if you have three numbers from two to five, that's a thousand times more intense of an earthquake. It's the same idea with the hydrogen. So as you go up or down the pH scale, each number represents a tenfold difference in the concentration of hydrogen. I want to point out too, an important number that we'll come back to often is that human blood, your blood is maintained at about 7.4. And that's a very important homeostatically uh, maintained level. If you lose more than half a pH value. So if you go up to 7.9 or down to 6.9, we call that death, right? So the body really has to keep that pH at 7.4 very, very closely regulated. And we'll talk more about that as we go through the two semesters. So let's take a look at this continuum on the bottom. Again, this is the same scale turned on its side. So we're going from pH of zero. Come on. There we go. From pH of 0 up to 14, 0 increasingly acidic, toward 14 increasingly basic or alkaline, 7 smack dab in the middle neutral. So knowing this, let's take a look and you'll fill in the blanks here. So based upon what I said, pH 3 would be a 10 times stronger acid than pH what? pH 3 would be a stronger acid than pH Four. Good. Remember, because the lower the number, the stronger the acid. And it's a tenfold difference, so each number is a tenfold uh, difference. Now, what about 6? Six? Six, pH 6 is a 10 times stronger acid than pH 7. Now, let's turn the question around. pH 13 is a 10 times weaker acid than what? Now, you could write weaker acid. What else could you write there? Stronger base. Okay, so you can change that in your mind, whatever way you like to work this. But pH 13 would be a 10 times weaker acid or stronger base than pH 12. pH 4 is 100 times stronger acid than pH. I'm hearing a couple. I'm hearing some six. Are we okay with that one? Right? 10 times 10. So 4 is 100 times stronger than pH 6. 12 is 100 times stronger acid than pH 14. Good. So when you, when you, when you look at the scale, that means that P, from pH 1 to pH 14, you've got this ridiculously different you know, per, you know, fold in hydrogen numbers. It right, looks like our national debt, some huge number that's unimaginable. Right. Does that make sense? Okay, so the, the tenfold, hundredfold difference in hydrogen concentration. Okay, so a buffer is something that's going to keep the pH from moving. So clearly I'm telling you your body maintains your pH at around 7.4 of your blood. That means your blood must have some buffers in it molecules that would keep that pH from fluctuating very much, just like your hot tub or pool or something else that you might maintain or heard about. Uh, it's the same kind of idea. Now, not only do we have um, bicarb, you've heard of bicarbonate, maybe if you have a pool or hot tub you've ever taken care of, you're throwing in big bags of Arm & Hammer baking soda, basically, into the pool to maintain as a buffering. Same thing, your body has bicarb, same idea. There's also other proteins and other mechanisms in your body that help maintain your blood pH. Now, I want to point out one thing that drives a little bit of confusion here. If the pH value increases, right, if the pH number, if the value of the pH increases, you're actually becoming more alkaline, more basic. What I'll have students say is say, oh, the pH is going up. And what they usually are meaning when they say that, because we're still learning about this, they'll say, oh, I know what they'll say. They'll say it's becoming more acidic, right? It's becoming more acidic. And they'll say the pH is going up because we, we forget that this is an inverse relationship. So to say that the pH is going up actually means that it's becoming more basic, right? So just be really clear. I'll be very clear when I state it in a question. And you need to be very clear when you're conversing or writing about this because it is easily confused. 
If I say that the pH value is decreasing, then it is becoming more acidic. Right? The value is going down towards zero. Again, your body has bicarbonate and phosphates and other proteins, all of which act as, as buffers and keep that blood pH right at 7.4. We've got uh, a small conversation on water today, and then we have a walkthrough of the major molecules. We'll look at carbohydrates, we'll look at lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. And that will finish up our, our chapter two material, just so you know where we're heading with this. So we need to appreciate water a little bit, to appreciate our biochemistry, to appreciate the, the chemical reactions that occur in our body. We need to spend just a moment thinking about water because most of the chemical reactions in our body are in fact occurring in an aqueous environment or in the presence of water. So water does a lot of very important things for our overall well-being. Uh, one of them is that it helps distribute our, or maintain our body temperature or distribute our body heat. So your blood, right, there's a fair amount of your blood that's made up of water. And as your blood is being circulated around your body, it is carrying that heat with it and distributing the heat. It's the same idea that um, Lake Michigan, right, is a big heat sink, if you will. There's a lot of uh, heat in the summer that is captured by the water, keeping the lakeshore a little bit cooler than inland. And in the wintertime, that heat also uh, keeps a little bit more temperate here uh, because, again, we've got the lake holding on to this temperature. Number two, remember we talked about the serous membranes, the pericardium, the pleura, and the peritoneum. And those serous membranes have between the parietal and the visceral layer a little bit of water, serous fluid, which acts as a lubricant. And this is going to keep our organs sliding over each other quite nicely. Water is the main solvent. In lab two, I mentioned the word solvent. A solvent is what everything's dissolved in. So most of the chemical reactions, most of the proteins of your body, the enzymes, are all sitting in an aqueous or watery environment. Number four, again, chemical reactions are taking place in water. And remember, water is polar. And what's going to dissolve in water? Those who haven't been to lab yet haven't heard this yet, perhaps. But what sort of things are going to dissolve or dissociate in water? Those things which are themselves polar, right? And most of your proteins are going to be negatively or positively charged. And so they're going to mix well or dissolve or dissociate or interact well with water. And then finally, as blood is being pumped, we're transporting proteins, waste products, hormones, you name it. Everything's being distributed and transported through our body through water. If you've taken a general chemistry course, that in some textbooks the cover will say general chemistry or it might even say inorganic chemistry. Because in a general chemistry course, you don't get much biochemistry you're learning mostly about inorganic molecules, that is, molecules that don't have carbon. When you get to an organic chemistry class, now you're dealing with molecules that contain carbon. So that's kind of the dividing line. The exception is CO2. CO2, carbon dioxide, even though it has a carbon, is considered an inorganic molecule because it's very, very small. So that's really the only exception, is that CO2 is considered inorganic. Everything else in your body that has a carbon in it would be considered an organic molecule. So let's go through these organic molecules. Now, I didn't use the word organic molecules on day one. I used the word macromolecules. Okay, so let's think about that hierarchy. We go from atoms to what? Atoms combine to make molecules, simple molecules, and those simple molecules combine to make macromolecules. And what were the four classes of macromolecules? Proteins, right? Carbs, lipids, and nucleic acids. Those four groups of macromolecules, aka the four groups of organic molecules. Okay, so what really what I'm going to describe here for the next few minutes are the four different types of macromolecules. Again, they all contain carbon, so they're considered organic molecules. And this is the basis of your biochemistry, right? Biochemistry is really the study of organic molecules and how they are made and interact with each other in your body. Now, you're not going to become a biochemist or an organic chemist in the next few minutes, but I do want to introduce the important key ideas of each of these different macromolecules. 
That will finish up chapter two. And then likely today, I'll get a little bit into chapter three. Now, the chapter three material will not be on the exam. And what we'll finish up with for the exam will be today's chapter two content. So carbohydrates, you might know them better as starches or sugars or a special type of carbohydrate is glycogen. These are the primary, not the only, but these are the primary energy molecule for life. So most of us are consuming quite a few carbohydrates a day. We can break carbohydrates into three basic groups based upon their size. Monosaccharides, single sugar groups, mono one. Disaccharides, two sugar groups, holding hands chemically. Or three or more sugar groups connected together. We're going to call it a polysaccharide. So monosaccharide one, disaccharide two, polysaccharide three or more sugars connected together. Let me give you an example right now. Monosaccharide, put it next to it, glucose. Glucose is, we'll talk about that being a monosaccharide. As far as disaccharides, put next to that sucrose. Sucrose, regular old table sugar, the stuff you buy at Meyer in the five pound bag, that is sucrose. That's a disaccharide. And polysaccharide, put next to that starch and glycogen. I've already got those listed up there, starches and glycogen. Okay, so put those or make an arrow that those are specifically polysaccharides. You're not, you're not going to have to memorize the structures. I just want you to realize that monosaccharides are molecules that contain between three and seven carbon atoms. Again, these are all carbon-containing organic molecules. And the most common example that you hear about all the time is glucose. All right, glucose is the primary energy fuel for your brain. It's very, very important in your overall metabolism. Another monosaccharide that we hear about every day because it's in a lot of our food is fructose fructose corn syrup type thing. So we've got carb uh, sorry, glucose and fructose, two very common examples of monosaccharides. Now, if two monosaccharides connect chemically into one larger molecule, this would be a disaccharide. And the example I have here is sucrose. So sucrose is actually a glucose and a fructose holding hands. Again, you're not responsible for knowing the chemical structure. But do know that sucrose is a disaccharide, and that is composed of a glucose and fructose chemically held together. Then there are the polysaccharides. Again, three or more, and it can be hundreds, even thousands, of sugar groups linked chemically. And um, polysaccharides really are the major storing energy uh, molecule. So, why does one, what does one eat typically before they're going to do a big race? The night before, they're going to do what? Pasta, right? They're going to eat some complex carbs, and those carbs are going to enter the body, and it takes a little while for them to break down. And those complex carbs are being broken down, and they're going to be broken down into energy, right? And give energy during the race the next day. Um, now, common polysaccharides, uh, starches. Now, where do we get all starches? Starches are made for us from, do I hear plants, right? That's where we get starches. Um, there are no starches in your body, right? Animals don't have starches. Plants make starches for us, like potatoes. Now, the other carbohydrate, the other polysaccharide I want you to know about is glycogen. Now, glycogen is shown here in this cartoon. Again, you're not responsible for the chemistry of it, but just know that glycogen is a long chain of glucose molecules, and you have a lot of glycogen in your body. Glycogen is our major energy storing molecule. It is stored in our muscles so that when we're about to have a race, we've always got a little bit of energy stored up, and it's also produced by your liver. So your liver is making glycogen. It's maintained in your muscles. It's maintained by your liver. And that glycogen is released when you need energy. Your brain must have glucose to, to do its job. And so as your blood sugar starts to drop, remember we talked about some homeostatic kind of ideas and negative feedback. As your blood sugar begins to drop, glycogen starts getting broken down. And that glycogen now is going to feed your brain and feed your overall metabolism with sugar. So you can go quite a while without eating because you've got glycogen stored up in your body. 
Now, a little bit back to the basic chemistry of this. I mentioned before synthesis and decomposition. And I also introduced the idea of anabolic and catabolic, right? We've used those words. There's another pair of words, though, to describe how sugars are going to be put together. And these are condensation and hydrolysis reactions. Now, when you hear the word condense or condensation, what comes to mind? I want you to have a picture in your mind. When you hear the word condensation, what comes to mind? Production of water, okay. Let's, let's take away the chemistry just for a moment and think about in your everyday experience, for those who haven't had a lot of chemistry. Condensation means what? It does mean the same thing, right? But in our everyday experience, where do we hear about condensing? Or water is, is there's condensation. What does that mean to you? On a glass, right? Summertime, condensation, the water that forms on the outside of the glass, okay? So I want you thinking it is water forming, right? Condensation is water forming. It's, it's also, the way I think about it, it's where the molecules, the, the moisture molecules from the atmosphere are condensing. They are appearing. They're being formed, right, on the outside of the glass. Another way of thinking about it, when I'm boiling uh, pasta or, or vegetables or something in a pot, and you lift off the, the, the lid, right, the steam has done what? Steam's come up and has condensed on the inside of the lid. So you've got the formation of water. Things are coming together to form that condensation. So in, in this biochemistry, condensation is where two compounds come together, and oh, by the way, water is formed. The opposite of that is hydrolysis. Break that word down, change the syllables around, and you have hydrolysis, right? Hydro water, lysis to break. So in hydrolysis reaction, you're breaking water. And we're going to see that when two compounds are broken, um, there's water that has to be put into the reaction, and that water is actually broken or split or lysed to make this happen. So let me show you this to you in a picture. You've already seen this. Uh, it was across the top of that multicolored slide, but it was really kind of small to see. So what we have here is a glucose molecule, right, a monosaccharide. And this monosaccharide plus another glucose can form chemically, there's the arrow, can form a disaccharide called maltose. Okay, there's our second disaccharide. So you, we know sucrose, right, was a fructose and glucose chemically combined. Maltose are two glucose molecules holding hands. And this would be a condensation reaction when I go from left to right. So condensation reaction, because when these two monosaccharides combine, Look what's formed, right? Water is formed. So the very nature of the biochemistry is that as these two sugars are combined to make a, a disaccharide, water is formed, condensing, right? Like condensation on the outside of your glass, water is formed. Now, if you notice, this arrow is bidirectional. So it's possible for the opposite reaction to occur. Now, what other words would we, well, let's go back. What words can we use to describe this going from left to right? It is condensation. What other word can I use? I'm making something. Synthesis or anabolic, right? I'm building something. It's going to take energy. Now, if I turn it around and I'm now going from right to left, I could now call this a decomposition reaction, right? I'm taking one molecule, breaking it into its components. I could also call it a catabolic reaction. We know that means breakdown. And now the new word we're going to use is hydrolysis hydrolysis. So in order for this maltose to be broken, for this chemical bond to be broken, and in order for the two individual glucose molecules to be released, I need to put water into the reaction, and that water basically gets cleaved or lysed, and that, that H2O gets split, and there's an H put here and an OH put here. Again, you're not responsible for the chemistry of that, but recognize that Hydrolysis is the opposite of condensation. I'm going to make a big pass on this slide. Uh, so I'm going to give you um, just a general statement, but I'm not going to ask you to know any specifics. When your body takes in carbs, right, when you, when you eat anything with starches in it, uh, when you eat any kind of, you know, let's go with a Snickers bar, eat some sort of energy bar, you're taking in carbohydrates. 
and we know that as you take in those carbohydrates, your body's going to break those bonds apart. And as we break bonds apart, those are catabolic reactions, and catabolic reactions are going to release energy. So your body gets energy from what it consumes. Now, there's a bunch of different reactions necessary to break down those sugars, and the overall name for taking in molecules and getting energy out of it is this term cellular respiration. Now, I'm not going to dive into this deeply. You'll dive into this if you take a general bio course. You'll also talk more about this perhaps in some 106. And clearly, if you take microbiology, you will know this story very, very well. So because it's going to show up in other places, I'm not going to dive into it deeply here. But just know that as you take in sugar, the overall idea is that that sugar is broken down. And from it, we get energy. And the overall process is called cellular respiration. Now, that word throws people off a little bit because we think of respiration as being what? Everyday language, respiration is breathing in and out, right? Respiration. And that's necessary for life. But from a cellular standpoint, cellular respiration, and it will always have the word cellular respiration. This is the unique process by which energy has gotten from molecules. And there's different steps of this, and I'm just not going to go there. So we're just not going to worry about any of the specifics here. Now, I'm going to give you a pass on that, but you do have to have this chart on the left memorized by Monday, Tuesday. No, just kidding, right? Um, that is actually a wall chart that I took a picture of, and it represents the majority of the biochemical reactions occurring in your body, right? That is the overall metabolism. I, I keep asking my children for a shower curtain with this on it, right? Because I think this is a great thing to know. Now, at one point in my history, I had to basically have this thing memorized, and I did, and I've forgotten much of it because I just don't use it every day, but you can't see it from where you are, but right here, this highlighted thing, let me go to a highlight. Get this to work. Oh, well. Right here, that highlighted thing up there is glucose. I know you can't see that. And as your body takes in glucose, straight down the middle of this thing, this is the breakdown of glucose. And at the bottom of this, we get out of it ATP. That's all I want you to know right now. All right, so as we take in sugar, our body breaks it down step by step by step by step, and we get out of it ATP. Now that ATP that we produce is then used to, to allow to energize all of the other reactions in your body. So in different parts of this, you've got the making of proteins, the making of lipids, the making of nucleic acids, the making of all the other molecules that your body needs is somewhere else over in the sub parts of this diagram. Now, all of these reactions together would be referred to globally as your metabolism, right? We hear about, you know, metabolism. Where have you heard that word in everyday language? Metabolism. Do you hear that at all? Right. I have a fast metabolism. I have a slow metabolism. Usually what people are saying is that they either store energy well or they, or they burn energy well. But metabolism is simply the collection of all of the chemical reactions that occur in your body. We can break metabolism down into two subcategories. And what are those? All the chemical reactions, metabolism, can be broken down into anabolic versus catabolic, right? Your anabolism and your catabolism, all of the reactions that are building anabolic versus all the reactions that are breaking down catabolic would make up the collective thing called your metabolism. Does that make sense? So metabolism equals catabolism plus anabolism, the cats and the anabolisms. Now, this overall idea of cellular respiration. There's that word again. I guess I want you to know just a little bit more about this, just not to dive into the, into the depths of this, but I want you to look at this right here. And what this is, this is the basic equation of cellular respiration. It's not even the chemical, the chemical equation, just the basic idea. And that is every day, as an organism, and every day, every one of your 75 trillion cells is having to take in sugar. That sugar is right, going to be necessary for energy. 
every one of your cells is going to take in water, and every one of your cells is going to take in oxygen. And what does it do with that? With that sugar, with that oxygen, and with that water, it is going to create, at the bottom of this, not only does it say ATP, but it also says down here CO2. You can't see it, but it's down there. And from this, you're going to create carbon dioxide, water, and ATP or energy. That is the basic equation of cellular respiration. Now, that equation is essentially the reverse of photosynthesis. And we're certainly not going to discuss photosynthesis here. But just know that plants are doing the photosynthesis, and that's basically what? What is photosynthesis? Energies do what for us? They create oxygen, right? And where do they get that oxygen from? How do they create it? What are, they, what are the building blocks for plants? Plants must do what? They better get some, they have to get carbon dioxide, right? And they have to do what? Get water. And they get energy from the sun. And they convert that into oxygen that we breathe, right? So it's kind of the reversal uh, of this whole idea of respiration. Just a global idea. Again, let's break, let's just uh, drop this table. Nothing of concern here. You're not going to worry about this at all. I just want you to know that as sugars are taken into your body, you do get water, carbon dioxide, and ATP. That's all I want you to know about carbohydrates for this first exam. They are the major energy molecule. Um, they come in a few different types. And that's about it for now. Lipids. Group number two, lipids, you, this is the, the official name, but you may talk not about lipids so much, but more about fats or oils in your everyday language. They're all considered lipids. <coughs> the major property of all lipids is that they are insoluble in water. And what's another way of saying that from our vocabulary, especially those who had lab yesterday? If something is insoluble, does not dissolve in water, then we would say that it is Nonpolar, right? Things that dissolve in water are polar. Things that would not dissolve in water, that are insoluble in water, we would say are nonpolar. So insoluble in water, same as nonpolar. The most common uh, lipid in your body, or a very common type of lipid in your body, are triglycerides. You'll hear about those. You go to the doctor, they're going to do some blood work on you. They're going to tell you about your cholesterol levels. And they're also going to tell you what your triglyceride levels are. If your triglycerides are high, it basically means you've got too much fat, too many lipids traveling in your blood. And we know that those high triglycerides over time can contribute to cardiovascular disease. So we try to keep our triglyceride levels down. But fats are an amazing source of energy. Sugars are not the only place where you can get energy. Let me just go back. Triglycerides, tri, three, glycerol, uh, and, and I'll show you this in a moment, but triglycerides are composed of three fatty acids. Hold on to that thought, and I'll show you what that means, plus a glycerol backbone. But lots and lots of energy come from triglycerides. Lots and lots of energy come from lipids. This is why Eskimos and other native groups can eat blubber all winter right? and survive quite well. It's why people can go on an Atkins diet or a low-carb diet. You can basically cut out all the carbs in your diet and do quite well. In fact, you'll get a lot of energy from eating butter. And that's what Atkins diet people do, right? They, they go on a low-carb diet, and they consume all the blue cheese, all the, all the meat, all the bacon, all the, you know, all sorts of fatty substances, and they get from it lots of energy. So we can certainly get a lot of energy from fats. Here is a triglyceride molecule. Tri, three, three parts. And I told you those three parts, there was three fatty acids. Now this is the fatty acids, there's in the purple. So there's a fatty acid, here's a fatty acid, three fatty acids. And the pink box, this is the glycerol. Okay, what does that fatty acid look like? Tell me what that fatty acid, that box, that purple box looks like. What have we, we've already seen a molecule that looks like that. 
and it was in my discussion back on covalent bonds. What does that look an awful lot like? Go back to the discussion of water as a po polar covalent molecule. And what was my example of a non-polar covalent molecule? Hexane, right? That six carbon sugar, I showed you the six carbons with all the hydrogens in around it. And I said that molecule, all the electrons are being shared, it's covalent, but they're being shared completely equally such that there's no polarity on the molecule. So that would be a non-polar molecule, wouldn't it? Hexane. And sure enough, what you have here is a fatty molecule. You've got three fatty acids, and they look like hexane. Okay, it's just a general idea of looking at something. Now, the same idea, these, these three fatty acids in this glycerol, look what they do. They combine through an enzyme to create the triglyceride, and look what else is formed, three waters. So it's the same idea, right? We could say this is also a condensation reaction. It is an anabolic reaction. It is a synthesis reaction because you're taking four individual entities, one glycerol and three fatty acids, and you're combining to make one molecule, a triglyceride. Now, when you talk about fats around the kitchen, around the house, and in, and in dietetic type classes, you'll hear the discussion about saturated versus unsaturated fats. And what, did we, what have we learned through the years? Saturated fats are to be minimal, right, in our diet. We don't want to eat completely saturated fats. We want instead to have unsaturated fats. And we've been told, in fact, if you asked a dietitian or asked a physician 35 years ago or so, are fats bad, you would have gotten sort of a yes answer. All fats are bad. And the old food pyramids put all fats at the very top of the pyramid to be taken in sparse amounts. But what's the new food pyramid show? There's a slice on the new food pyramid that has fats, healthy fats, right? Um, and it has olive oils and some of the unsaturated fats as something that is actually protective of heart disease. So not all fats are bad. And some fats actually give us lots of energy and are very health, heart healthy. Now, what's the difference between saturated and unsaturated? What's the word saturated mean to you? Something is saturated. It is completely full, right? Not able to handle any more. It's completely, if your life is saturated, you just can't handle any more. So a saturated fat is one that looks like this top box. Now, when you look at this, what do you see? I see a bunch of carbons, right? A whole bunch of carbons. And those carbons are surrounded by as many hydrogens, sorry, those carbons are surrounded by as many hydrogens as it can handle. It is completely saturated, okay? So this is a saturated fat. Just look at it, and what you see is that every carbon, that carbon bond, carbon bond, carbon, you see hydrogens around every available spot. It is saturated. Now the problem with saturated fats is that they tend to stay solid at room temperature. So what sort of fats in your home stay solid in the cupboard? They don't run off as a, as, a, as a liquid. Butter, right? You can have butter. It's soft, but you can have butter in the cupboard and lard, right? Lard and, fat and butter, those are considered saturated fats. And we want to have fewer of those in our diet because we know that that saturated fat accumulates in a bad way. Versus unsaturated fats. Now look at the bottom one, and you see all those carbons across the bottom, but you also see a few places where there's an equal sign. That's called a double bond. And you'll see that wherever you see an equal sign, you don't see the hydrogens around it. It is not saturated. It is unsaturated. Now what unsaturated oils, unsaturated fats, they behave as oils at room temperature. So this would be your olive oil and your canola oil and your corn oils. All those oils, those vegetable oils, which, which are oils, which are liquid at room temperature, those are going to be unsaturated or polyunsaturated fats. Now, we know they're healthier for us. So years ago, before we understood everything, companies said, oh, fats, you know, butter's bad, but who wants to spread olive oil on toast, right? Who wants to put liquid on toast? 
So they took olive oil, or they, so, sorry, they took vegetable oil, and now they did something to it to make it solid, right? Oleo, margarine. So now you could spread it on your toast. And everyone thought, oh, this is healthy because I've taken a, an unsaturated fat and I've made it solid for convenience of cooking and for buttering your toast. What have we learned? After 25 years of eating oleo, now they're saying, not good, right? Because in the manufacturing of making that polyunsaturated fat solid, we've actually chemically changed it to be even worse than butter. So now we're back to the all natural thing, right? Butter in moderation is better than eating the crappy margarine. And you'll see all kinds of reports on this and, and some controversy out there. But essentially, we're kind of moving away from those trans fats and from those uh, modified fats. So that's the idea of saturated versus unsaturated. Another very important lipid in your body are phospholipids. Now, I'll tear this apart in greater detail in chapter three. But phospholipids are a major part of your cell membranes. In lab this week, in lab two, I mentioned how the cell membrane is a gateway, how the cell membrane is a barrier, and we talked about diffusion and osmosis and the way by which molecules get into or out of a cell. This phospholipid layer around the cell membrane becomes a very integral, important part of maintaining your cell intensity, uh, integrity. So we'll see that phospholipids are really unique in that they're polar. Now, I just told you before that lipids, by their nature, are nonpolar, right? That was sort of the rule of thumb for lipids. But phospholipids, these things that make up your cell membranes, are unique in that they do have some charge to them. They do have some polarity to them, and we'll see how important that is when we get to chapter three. The, the, the bottom line of this, though, is that phospholipids are able to interact with water, right? So you've got water on the inside of a cell, you've got water outside of a cell, and this phospholipid barrier, right, becomes basically the barrier from the inside to the outside of the cell, and we'll, we'll, we'll break that down more when we get to chapter three, like I said. So phospholipids have a polar portion, and a non-polar portion. Now here's another word that I want you to see and understand, and that is hydrophilic and hydrophobic. Hydro, water. Philic means an affinity of or a love for. So a molecule that is hydrophilic has an affinity for or is attracted to or can interact with water, whereas a molecule that is hydrophobic has a phobia, has a fear of, is moving away from water. Okay. So let's put those things together. A polar molecule would be hydrophilic. Do you agree? Like dissolves like. So a molecule that has polarity would dissolve in a polar solvent like water. So we would say that it's hydrophilic. It interacts with water. A molecule that does not interact with water, which is fearing water, which moves away from water, would be nonpolar a.k.a. hydrophobic. Okay, so these are interchangeable terms. And you've got to be thinking, okay, hydrophobic, uh, nonpolar kind of go together, and hydrophilic and polar go together. This is a cartoon of a phospholipid. And not to get too crazy right now, but what we see is that this long end right here, this, these chains, those are like the hexanes, or those are like the saturated fats I just talked about. So that would be a nonpolar or hydrophobic region, the fatty acid portion. But on the top part, there's a, there's a group up here that is polar. That is, it has a charge. So we would say that this portion is hydrophilic. So phospholipids, the molecules that make up much of your cell membrane, are very unique in that they're partially polar and partially Nonpolar, partially hydrophilic and partially hydrophobic. The last lipid that I want to include so that you have this list, if you will, are steroids. Okay. Steroids are also lipids. Um, they have a very unique structural look to them. You're not going to have to memorize this. But this molecule here is actually cholesterol. Cholesterol is a fat. Cholesterol is a lipid. Um, cholesterol, though, is also very important. Cholesterol gets a bad rap. 
uh, you go to the doctor and we want to check your cholesterol levels. We want to make sure your cholesterol levels are sufficiently low so that you don't have any heart disease as a result of high cholesterol. However, without cholesterol, you've got some other problems. So your cholesterol levels cannot be too low because then you wouldn't have enough cholesterol to make testosterone. You wouldn't have enough cholesterol to make estrogen and progesterone. So all of the sex steroids, testosterone, progesterone, uh, estrogen, all of those molecules have first uh, cholesterol in their, in their biochemistry. So it's from cholesterol that we make the sex hormone. So you have to have enough of these sex hormones, or there's enough cholesterol to make sex hormones. Now this is what happens to women, I shouldn't say just women, people who are anorexic. They decrease their fat levels so low in their body, and they decrease their cholesterol levels so low in their body that they no longer can make sex steroids. And so now these women become amenorrhetic. They stop having periods, and they stop having all of those normal sex functions. Their hormones are out of whack. Right? So that's one of the side effects of anorexia is when the fat levels get too low, the, the sex hormones are depleted, and they don't have normal cycling. That's all I want to say right now about lipids. Okay, so we've talked about carbs. We've talked about lipids. Let's move on to proteins. Questions so far? We're doing okay? Okay, let's talk about proteins a little bit. Now, proteins are important molecules and very, very important macromolecules. They all are. Uh, they are constructed of amino acids. Now, uh, amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. In your body, there are 20 different amino acids. And these 20 different amino acids are going to combine to make proteins. I've already mentioned enzymes. Enzymes themselves are proteins. And um, we know that enzymes increase the likelihood of a chemical reaction occurring. Other things that proteins do, right, just a list of important things that proteins do. Number one, they provide structure. Your bones are made a lot, a lot of protein in your bones. That protein is collagen. You're not, uh, I don't need you to know about collagen yet, just as an example, though. Again, all of your enzymes are proteins, so they're regulating your metabolism and your overall chemical reactions. Some proteins provide protection. Keratin is the protein in your hair, in your fingernails. That's a protective kind of molecule. Uh, your muscles contract, change shape because of proteins called myosin and actin. We'll talk about those later. And certainly, certain molecules are being transported through your body on the back of proteins like hemoglobin, which carries oxygen and CO2 through your blood. So we see that proteins are, are just amazing. You know, your body's made up of thousands and thousands of different types of proteins. I mentioned enzymes. We know what they do. Let me just kind of give you a picture, a different way of thinking about enzymes. Now, enzyme uh, chemistry has its own vocabulary, so I don't want to have you throw this off, but this blue guy down here is the enzyme. Again, it's a protein, and proteins all come in different shapes and sizes. This one has this very particular odd shape to it. Okay, so that's that protein, that's that enzyme. The substrate is whatever molecule interacts with the enzyme. Okay, so the substrate interacts with the enzyme, and they come into very, very close proximity. And in this reaction, that substrate got broken down into two products. Let's just call it A and B. Okay, so what kind of reaction was this? This enzyme catalyzed what kind of reaction? It broke something down, so that would be considered either catabolic or decomposition, right? And what happened to that is that the enzyme came into close proximity to the substrate and somehow allowed for that rearrangement of the chemical bonds, didn't it? It, it allowed for the rearrangement of the electrons. And as a result, now we get our two products, A and B. Now, this could have been the other way, right? You could turn this whole thing around because some other enzymes, a different enzyme, would be anabolic. And it would take these two substances and combine them with the enzyme, and you'd be going to the left to actually form the substrate or form the product. So this could be either way, right, when we think about enzymes. Enzymes have been described as being a lock and key. Every key, right, has a slightly different 
groove on it and it only fits into certain locks. And that's how specific enzymes are. Enzymes are very, very specific. They do one job, right? My key opens up one door and that's it, unless it's a master key. But in enzyme world, we've always got room specific keys. So I mentioned that enzymes have a particular shape. All proteins have a very particular shape, and the shape of that protein is critical to the job that that protein does. So the enzyme has a certain shape because it's going to interact like a lock and key with certain molecules and do a certain chemical reaction. Other proteins, the ones that make up your blood, or sorry, that make up your bones, et cetera, have a different shape. If you mess up the shape of the protein, you mess up the ability of the protein to do its job. And um, when we talk about proteins, we talk about the primary structure. Now, I told you that amino acids uh, make up proteins. Basically, a protein is a long string of amino acids. Okay, a very, very long string. And that would be called the primary structure. Just one amino acid, AA, followed by another amino acid, AA, followed by another amino acid. So that would be the primary structure. Secondary structure, that long chain of amino acids can start to twist and turn. Now, the twisting and turning of that long chain is directed largely through hydrogen bonds. Remember what those were? Hydrogen bonds were weak. Those were the dotted lines, right? They were weak bonds or interactions between molecules. So these hydrogen bonds are going to allow for the protein to twist. Let me show it in a picture in a different way. So at the top, this is the primary structure. So the protein is made up of a chain, like, like a train, right, of one car after the next, and each car is a different amino acid. You're not responsible for knowing this yet, but just know that each of these three-letter codes represents a different amino acid. Once you have that long chain of amino acids, it can twist and turn on itself, and that is called the secondary structure, and that's driven by hydrogen bonds. Then you get the final three-dimensional structure. So that protein is going to fold and twist into a final shape. Just like an enzyme would be of a particular shape, every protein is of a particular shape. We would say that that is its tertiary structure, okay? Three, third level. So you got primary structure, secondary structure, tertiary structure. I'm not going to worry about quaternary for this discussion today. So don't worry about quaternary. So we got primary, secondary, and tertiary structure of proteins. Now, why is it important that proteins maintain their shape? Well, if you change the shape of a protein, or if you denature a protein, that is, take it apart, then it no longer does its job. And denaturation uh, happens at high temperatures, and denaturation also happens at low pH. So one of, the, one of the devastating things about a high fever, right, if you have a high fever for a long time, that high fever is starting to negatively affect your enzymes, and it can lead to brain damage and other problems. Or if you have a low pH, that low pH can also cause the breakdown of your proteins, of your enzymes, and now death is on the, uh, death is eminent. So we've got, we've got to, you know, keep our temperature in check, we've got to keep our pH of our body in check, because if we don't, it denatures our proteins. So this represents, on the left-hand side, a functional enzyme, one that's working, and this green chain represents the long series of amino acids, and you see that it's twisted into a particular shape. And these three amino acids, shown as red and yellow, are the ones that are interacting specifically with this substrate. So that's what we call the active site. That's where the lock and key are coming together. If I, however, have low pH or high temperature, that protein becomes unraveled. And it loses its three-dimensional shape. And now that red amino acid and these two yellow amino acids are no longer side by side. They no longer will work as a lock and key mechanism. Now, the other thing about proteins is that once you denature, they don't just spring back to shape when you bring the temperature back down or restore the pH. So once they're denatured, once they're destroyed, that's it. They don't recoil and, and, and go back to their original shape. And that's all I'm gonna share with you for this test for proteins.
okay? So proteins made by amino acids, major molecules of your body, enzymes are uh, proteins, and every protein has a particular shape, which is critical for its function, and if you denature or change that shape, then the protein no longer can do its job. Finally, we get to our last group of macromolecules, our last group of organic molecules. These are the nucleic acids. We talk less about these uh, because they don't give us any nutritional value. When you look on a, let me take a quick aside, when you look on a um, food label, what do you see? Oops, let me get this. So when you look on a food label, what do you see? You see carbs, right? We see carbs, carbohydrates. You'll definitely see proteins. And you'll definitely see lipids or fats, right? And your food label will, label, will, will tell you how many grams of each of those you have. And then it will say how many calories that food has. Now, if you go to Europe, it doesn't say calories. It'll say energy, right? Because the calories that we're consuming are actually a measure of the energy that we're receiving from that food. So labels in Europe don't say calories. They say energy. Energy equals, and it will say how many calories there are. So when you're looking at a food label, let's say there's four grams of carbs. There's five grams of protein, and there's two grams of fats or lipids. How many calories would there be in this product? Does anybody know how to calculate this? You can look at any food label and you'll get it right every single time. Every carb gives you four calories. Every gram of protein also gives you four calories. And every gram of lipids gives you nine. Remember I told you fats are high energy sources. So if you eat just a big old spoon of butter, you're going to get a lot of energy from it. Kind of gross. But you're going to get a big old wallop of energy from that tablespoon of butter. That's why there's so many calories, right, in fats. They, they're high calories, high energy. So if I had this product in front of me, how many calories would something with four carbs, five proteins, and two lipids be? What would you get? 4 times 4 is 16, 5 times 4 is 20, 2 times 9 is 18. So what is that? 54. Yes? So that product, that serving size, would be 54 calories. So took a look at any food product, multiply, and you say, how do they get the calorie count? Oh, they took the number of carbs, the number of proteins, the number of lipids, they multiply the carbs and proteins by four and the lipids by nine, and you will get plus or minus one calorie on your total calories. Okay, so that's where you're getting those numbers on your food labels. But notice there's no nucleic acids here, right? So we don't talk about nucleic acids as much because they don't, they're not in our food labels. But it is the fourth group of, it is the fourth group of uh, macromolecules. Now, Nucleic acids are not made of amino acids. They are made up of individual molecules called nucleotides. And I know you've heard of these um, because the nucleotides are the A, C, G, and T that we know and love and hear about, right? So A, C, G, and T are the nucleotides, the bases, if you will. And again, you're not responsible for uh, memorizing this structure, but this is the basic building block of a nucleotide. It is a base. That's like adenosine. Uh, there's a sugar group, and there's a phosphate group. Okay, so those are the three parts that make up a nucleotide, and that's what's going to be the building blocks of your nucleic acid. Let me give you just a couple of features about DNA and RNA, and we'll pretty much be done. So DNA, right? It's this major molecule. We hear about DNA all the time. It's our genes, right? Our DNA. This is our genetic code within us. And in our cells, as, a, as eukaryotes, our cells have the DNA contained in the chromosomes, which are in the nucleus of the cell. So most of your metabolism is directed really by your genes, by your DNA. What you see here reminds me of a spiral staircase, right? So here's the, the, the spiral staircase, right? 
These would be the handles of the spiral staircase. And then between the steps of this spiral staircase are the bases reaching in and holding hands. So you'll see thymine A, or T, uh, adenine A, C, cytosine, and G, guanine. A, C, T, and G. Now, RNA is the other nucleic acid that I want to at least introduce to you. We'll come into this more. Uh, RNA is a relay. Remember R for relay, and I think you'll be okay. So RNA is a relay molecule, and we'll see how critical RNA is in making proteins later in the course. Now, DNA is typically double-stranded. Right? You'll hear about it being double-stranded, that double spiral staircase. RNA molecules are typically single-stranded. So here's a comparison of the two. Again, this is just basic compare and contrast of RNA and DNA. So DNA is shown on the right. You see the double-stranded molecule, and it has uh, A, C, T, and G. The key is that it has T. Over on the left, you have RNA. RNA appears usually as a single-stranded molecule, SS, single-stranded versus double-stranded. And rather than T, you'll see a base called uracil, U. So if you, he if you see or hear anywhere along the way about Ts being in the, in the molecule, you know you're dealing with DNA. If you hear instead about uracils or Us, you know that you're dealing with an RNA molecule. And we'll, we'll talk about three or four different types of RNA in the next chapter. Now, this, the DNA is the major, or not the major, but one of the major molecules that make up your chromosomes. In fact, chromosomes are not just DNA. And I think that is, eh, I think most of us in common language, if we even think about this stuff, we think, oh, our chromosomes are just long molecules of DNA. Not quite. Your chromosomes right, you have 46 chromosomes in your cells, your chromosomes are actually composed of both DNA and proteins. There are a lot of proteins wound around and interacting with your DNA in the chromosomes. Now in lab this week, you're going to look at cells undergoing mitosis, and you're going to see that uh, the chromosomes only become visible during mitosis. They only become visible during this time of cell division. Uh, oftentimes, the, the the DNA and the proteins are so, um, un, they're, uh, they're unwrapped, right? They're so loosely associated that you can't see them. But during mitosis, the chromosomes do condense or they do come together and they become visible to us under the microscope. But this represents at the very top. This is that double-stranded DNA. And there are proteins that link up with the DNA and then allow it to coil and coil and coil until it looks like something that most of you have never even seen, kind of looks like a telephone cord. All right now, if you want to see a telephone cord, I think the Masonians open 365, right? So you don't, we don't see telephone cords anymore. But that's kind of what, what your chromosomes look like, this tightly wound DNA and proteins uh, combined. You've heard me say ATP. Okay. And ATP was the energy molecule of the cell. And ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. So it's adenosine. This is the same A that you find in DNA and RNA. Okay, so you've got this group up here. Oops. You've got this group up here called adenine. This is the A of DNA and RNA. You have it attached to a ribose. That's a sugar group. And then you've got three phosphate groups. All right, so that's why it's called ATP. Now this is... I think it's just kind of cool that ATP, this molecule we'll hear about a lot this semester, is really just a kind of a re-piecing together of a molecule we found in our DNA and RNA, a sugar, and these phosphate groups. The key is this, though, is that ATP has this little squiggle right here. That's a chemical bond. And that chemical bond is specifically high. And what that means, remember I told you that when, chemi when um, molecules are broken down, catabolic reactions, that energy is released. So when ATP breaks off this, this phosphate on the end, that particular removal of that phosphate gives off a lot of energy. And that is the, if you will, the currency of most of our chemical reactions. And we'll hear about ATP a lot this semester, uh, and certainly a lot of your biology courses. 
So as I said, when you have a anabolic reaction, right? When you have an anabolic reaction, when you're when you're building things up, it's going to require ATP. When you have a catabolic reaction, you're going to be giving off energy um, because you're going to be giving off that stored energy. The last slide is just a little review. Um, it just reminds you that when it comes to monosaccharides, they combine to make polysaccharides like starches, glycogen, that your amino acids combine to make proteins, and that nucleotides combine to make your nucleic acids like DNA and RNA. Make sure you know your building blocks. That's why this is called monomers and polymers. What does mer mean? Anybody know what mer means? Mer or mer, M-E-R or M-E-R-E. What is a polymer? Poly, many. Polymer is a molecule made up of many what? Parts. All right, so mer means parts. So a monomer is a molecule made up of only one part, and a polymer is, made, is a molecule made up of many parts. So the monomer, right, the monosaccharide combines to make the polysaccharide. And that brings us to the end of chapter two and the end of the material for the exam. And because my syllabus says I'm going to talk about chapter three, I'm going to say the first slide of it. I just want to, I'm going to feel good about myself by introducing chapter three, right? So I'm on schedule. So as I'm pulling that up for the last couple of minutes, uh, any questions at all about the exam? Any questions at all about what to do to prepare for this exam? on next Tuesday. That'll be a full-length exam. It'll be here in this room. You'll need that 884-E form. That's all we'll do. Um, it, most students have no issues with time on the first exam. You will have the, first, the full hour and a half to do it if you want, but I think most of, you will be, most of you will be done within an hour. It'll be 100 questions, maybe 101 questions. Um, most of it's multiple choice with a few fill in the blanks. There will be a couple of images for you to know from the screen. I'll always have some PowerPoint images on the screen, slides you've already seen or ones just like what you've seen. Name that thing. Make sure you know your body systems, can recognize your body systems, and know the organs and the functions of those body systems. Um, make sure you review all those directional terms and body regions that we did in lab. Um, there will be a case study, just a, a, a scenario that you'll read about and answer some questions, and that won't be a problem. Don't forget also about the Darley, that very first page that was in your supplement. Read through that, that Darley study tips and, and be prepared to tell me what you learned from that article about how to study for biology classes. And I think that's a good recap of what we're going to do. Now, that picture is a cell. The big purple dude is a cell. And those little yellow guys are bacteria. And this would represent one of your white blood cells that is capturing and gr grabbing after um, those cells. And this is a good review for this exam. What plane was used for A, B, and C? A. What plane was used to create that image? A. Sagittal. Am I hearing sagittal or mid-sagittal? What about B? I'm cutting off the front, right? I'm, I'm exposing the inside of the chest, so I've cut off the front. The other name for the frontal is coronal. And C. Transverse, also called cross-section. So there, I felt good. I started chapter three, and I said the word the cell. So we'll pick that up not until next Thursday. So Tuesday will be exam day. The following Thursday will be our first presentation on chapter two material. Remember, too, that these videos are reviewable on YouTube, and that link is also found off Blackboard, and I'll upload this presentation right now.